here, Denise. Um, yeah, so when we're talking about thermal bridging, uh, we've got different different types of thermal bridges. So we've got the you know geometric ones that we find basically at the edges of where our elements or building elements meet. Mm -hmm. So the you know the junctions uh, of walls or walls to roof or floor to walls um, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and so that's around the yeah. It's the basically what, what it is you have for geometric uh, thermal bridges. You have the R value of your wall, of your window, of your roof, each different kind of plane. And then um, the psi value is the reduction factor in that R value at the geometric thermal bridge because every corner gives you a little bit of extra surface area for energy to leak out of. Am I getting that correctly? Yeah. In general, you're you're right. You know, like the the heat flows through our elements, like the the mm. walls, roofs, and floors, is um, ideally or what we consider homogeneous, right? And mm. where that is disturbed, there's either more or less heat flow. So the psi value doesn't necessarily need to be just a negative value; it can also be a positive value. So, okay. but the the idea is that the heat flow is disturbed for whatever reason. Um, and you can see down in the picture um, where the materials um, is shown, that's um, that's what we're talking about. So in the center of like a wall structure, where we have steel framing, the the heat flow is even, but where we're getting towards the steel framing, that heat flow is disturbed. So all we do um, in that case is just calculate what that disturbance costs us in additional heat flow. Mm hmm makes sense to me and psi value it's the ah not a reduction factor a correction factor heat loss correction factor so like you said it could be positive or negative exactly it's just correcting what's happening in that disturbance um, and adjusting for that um, heat flow mm -hmm. so what we can do in these calculations or the uh, sections that you see here is we're calculating the total heat flow through the um through the detail mm -hmm. and then we are deducting the r values from both of the adjacent sides or just one construction system or up to three construction systems so these can get um quite complicated but sometimes when we're doing window installation um, we can get up to three details in one so we've got like reference values that we would deduct from the total heat flow and then what's left is what our side value is. Yeah, makes sense to me. And yeah, you got the R value of the floor, R value of the wall, and then the, the corner is your side value. You get that correction factor. Yeah. So in this, um, in this slide, you can see that um, I've, I've referenced sort of the internal um, lengths of the R values. So that's one thing that um, can differ between sort of passive house and or H1, because in H1, when we're modeling buildings, we're referencing the internal links for walls and floors. So our reference values for that correction factor have to be the internal dimensions when we're doing passive house, we have to reference the external dimensions of the building. So that's just a small difference, um, but it's important um, to calculate the correct factor. Yeah, so it sounds like you're saying that basically this whole box that gets highlighted here is just magically mm -hmm. not there in H1, like mm -hmm. we're just pretending it exists almost? Well, th uh, thank God in the new H1 it is there. Um, well, I'll bite not it's uh, it's not in the tables, but it's uh, when you're using verification method one. Sure, you can calculate it there. And then you got the FRSI value, which is not psi value. It sounds very similar, FRSI versus psi, but they're different. <laughs> difference. Well, that's just the temperature factor that we um, then can extrapolate off the um temperature gradients that you can see here so when you're when you're doing that side value calculation and you can um extrapolate the um, temperatures in and around the um the construction detail 
and uh, determine whether there's a surface temperature on the inside. <clears throat> Pardon. Pardon me. Um, that's lower than a certain number, and you can determine whether there's a risk or um, for mold or condensation. So in the in the program here, you can see there's a tiny little orange line and a red line on the inside face of that slab. Oh, you see that? Yeah. Um, so they're just a little bit thicker than the rest of the lines, and they, the orange line sort of indicates where um, the risk for mold is mm -hmm. given. So that's usually where the design temperature is um, resulting in 80% relative humidity, and where the red zone is, it's a sort of, um, condensation zone where the relative humidity would be up to 100%. Yeah. So basically, the set point for the interior air would be something around 20 degrees and what, 55% relative humidity or something like that? And yeah, then... the usual design interior is 20 degrees at 50% relative humidity. So that's just that... aesthetic. Yeah, and so that red line is just below the dew point temperature for that type of air. And then the orange line is if you cool down that air, does it get to 80% relative humidity, I guess? Yeah, that's kind correct. Like, and so you you adjust the external boundary condition according to your climate because it's not always the same. So you can sure. basically adjust it to whatever is the lowest potential temperature in your um, in your area. There are some uh, guidance temperatures in the passive house handbook if you want to you know use this method to to do your calculations for passive house. Um, yeah. Or if you just want to evaluate the risk for your area. Yeah, we mention that all the time. Just go on the Passive House Institute of New Zealand website, go to their uh, their resources, I think, page. And then on there, there's the, um, the details handbook and high performance details handbook. And uh, they have calculations that are already done for you with the RSIs based on interior and exterior temperatures. So yeah, keeps it easy, keeps it simple. But cool, how is it relevant for H1? Well, this is uh, this looks like a slide that we've seen before from our H1 changes part four down here for slabs and also yes. from three windows. Yeah, we briefly touched on that already earlier. Um, there is a um, part that is already incorporated in H1 with the, uh, the side value of the glass. Um, a bit rudimentary still, but <laughs> working on it and in the, in the floor slab calculations um, yeah. uh, slab edge there so basically the same as here is the same thing there cool so for floor systems for suspended floors um when you say current what do you mean by current this is just how typically people build with you know timber timber floor joists some sort of um subfloor yeah. on the top of it insulation in between ideally an air barrier underneath you've shown um, we recommend that all the time it doesn't always get put in there but that's our recommendation well that's you can tape the um like when you, if you use extreme board so you can take that and that's um good enough in all over new zealand's climate so the vapor mm -hmm. drive uh through all suspended floors isn't actually that problematic um you usually put like a dpm around the ground underneath mm -hmm. um but sort of taping, taping the strand for there is, is usually good enough. Uh, but just, you know, for uh, explanation, I've just gone through all the different construction system where we would find thermal bridging and what are sort of the most effective ways to mitigate that without, you know, getting too scientific um, and just showing you some images on how that can be achieved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so what's... What's going on here? We have current. This is what the what the heat flow looks like. That's with a steel steel, um, I guess a W section beam. Yeah. Uh, and then this is an this I beam and a con concrete pad. So um, when you've got um, uh, precast construction systems with overhangs, um, for example, so suspended floors can have steel beams in it. Um, most of them are constructed just using timber frame. You don't have to worry about anything there. 
we can see the disturbance in the images with the steel beams. So we, uh, um, we've got the first row um, in the steel beams. You can see that the cold from the exterior is conducted very far into the interior surface um, of the floor. Mm -hmm. in the first line, so that's all quite blue. These are all yeah. sort of temperature gradients from blue cold to warm in inside to make it make it easy. Mm -hmm. Then this is with thermal break on the outside of he of, of the beams themselves. It mm -hmm. almost looks like it's worse. Or am I just am I misinterpreting this? Because you got it zero degrees uh, thermocline in here, um, or. And then there's no well, the zero. the warm side is on on the top end of the images, so Correct. the top yeah. end of your floor, and then the cold side is at the at the bottom end. So when you're looking yeah. at the first image um, with the steel framing, the cold mm -hmm. goes quite far through the steel beams to the inside face of the floor. Whereas, whereas if you put in a, a little thermal break over the steel, like it's currently um, prescribed in the code, so yeah. just a little overlap um, over the I-beams on the exterior, you can see that um, it's the steel beams themselves are a lot warmer, and it's actually the warmth conducting outside yeah, rather than the cold conducting inside. So um, the surface temperatures um, are a lot better. So we haven't calculated the exact psi value for for these details because that's mm. you know way too much math. Sure, fair. You can find but, all of that in the in the handbook anyway. It was just yeah. about comparing, you know, what a continuous insulation exterior would do in comparison. We can yeah. see there's not the thermal breaks from the yeah. continuous insulation. But you have to make sure that those thermal breaks yeah. actually meet the insulation between the steel. Because if the thermal breaks just sitting on the steel with air around them, then they're not doing their job. Yeah. You want to prevent the airflow and you want to make sure that it's all nice and continuous. Like you said, you got that continuity there. So they're a little bit wider than the steel flange at the bottom to, to um to make sure they meet up with the with the insulation that's between this the the beams there, but um, you kind of cut out there for for a second, Denise. But I think what you were trying to say is that if you have the um, insulation on the outside of the beam, you'll keep the beam warmer. Um, the surfaces will be nice and warm of the beam, so you'll get less risk of condensation on the beam because you can see it's all over that ten degree mark. So there is a less of a risk of condensation. But if you put the fully continuous insulation on the outside, not only are you keeping your beams warm, but you're also pulling these lines down a little bit farther. So you get warmer temperatures throughout your floor a little bit more. Um, so yeah, just a little bit better. And then here with the, with the concrete beam, you can see that if you have zero degrees on the outside, um, your concrete floor is basically going to be zero degrees all the way to the interior because of the thermal mass of concrete. If you're putting your thermal mass outside, it's just going to be the same temperature as outside, and it's going to stay at a fairly even temperature, even if that temperature is zero degrees. But if you put some external insulation on it, then it stays the same temperature as your interior. The thermal mass is on the interior of that uh, of that insulation and therefore you'll have a nice even interior temperature as opposed to a nice even exterior temperature so you know and i mean put, how often how often are we seeing these uh, concrete overhangs or balconies <laughs> or where there's just nothing nothing on the exterior um, yeah. and you can only imagine how cold it is just on the underside of whatever flooring is uh, is well, on I can tell you my my the floor of my apartment is is this floor. It's this one right here. Um, all winter long, I need to wear shoes inside the apartment because it's just way too cold. My feet are just freezing, even though I keep the air temperature inside my apartment at a nice steady 21. Usually throughout the whole winter, I spend a lot of money on heating. Um, keep the interior at 21, but my my floors are just ice cold all winter long. And that's because it's, it's a suspended floor over the garage. And 
it's just ice, it's just bad. And I, I tried to bother the body corporate of my building to say, hey, are you guys going to install some floor insulation because the healthy homes regulations say you have to? And they're like, ah, well, no, it's just too difficult. And we're not sure if it's the body corporate who has to do it or if it's your um, your uh, owner of the unit who has to pay for it. And there's the ceilings in the way and we can't do it and it's too hard and blah, 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 blah. So long story short, it, it's never going to get done at my building. <laughs> So I, I very viscerally feel <laughs> this, um, and yeah, thermal bridging is, is a bad thing, but, um, here's another example, specialty flooring, uh, pod floors. So what is this? This is, um, EPS insulation in squares. And then you can see some ribs where some steel goes down into cuts in the EPS. And then the whole slab gets poured, the concrete goes down into those ribs. So you have basically a waffle slab. Um, that's what we call them in Canada. I'm not sure if that's what they're called here, but a yeah. nice waffle slab on your floor. And uh, yeah, we got the thermoclines here to the right, if you want to explain. Oh yeah, so we've got uh, the top picture um, is just a, a standard um, raft slab without any any further insulation under under the ribs. So you can see that it's still uh, conducting quite a bit of heat outside um, there. And then the picture underneath is um, a raft slab with some insulation under those ribs. Yeah, um, so it looks like there's one like, layer of continuous insulation at the bottom then they put the raft insulation on top of it and then they pour the concrete in there is that what i'm seeing here yeah pretty much there's there's different system like uh if you if you know the the rip raft system for example uh, they usually have continuous rips all the way to the ground so if you wanted to have that um you know limited thermal bridging effect you'd have to add some insulation onto onto the rip raft but um We've got yeah. ponds as well. It's very popular down in uh, the South Island. This flooring system. Yeah. Denise, you might have and to. Repeat. <laughs> you uh, you you cut out there. What, what were you saying? Oh, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? We're going across the world here, literally as far as possible. <laughs> yeah, and it's very it's very rural here. Um, yeah. Maybe they need to hold the conference uh, in. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, I think you were saying that that usually the raft slabs will just have the concrete going right down to the ground, and so if you wanted to, you could just dig slightly deeper and put a strip of insulation into that little pocket there, just to you know put some insulation underneath that that concrete rib there. Um, yeah. But you were saying something was popular. What's popular down in the South Island? Oh, the the max raft system that you can see here on the on the image because um, it is fully insulated even under the ribs. So sure. um, it's you know it's proven very popular and very efficient. It's used a lot on passive houses too. Yeah. yeah. One stop shop gets it done. You don't have to think about adding extra things to it. it just comes done already. So cool. And so for wall systems, steel framing. Oh my goodness, steel framing. Yeah. This is something that I've had to, unfortunately, you know, veto on a project. Someone wants to put steel framing to replace timber framing, and they think it's as easy as just swapping out the studs. But what they don't realize is that uh, the steel studs are much more thermally conductive than timber. And therefore, you get real problems with uh, with condensation and just, you know, you don't get a very high R value, something that wouldn't even meet the H1 requirements if you're uh, if you're doing your schedule values or even your calculation values. But the other option is to put a thermal break and it doesn't really change it that much, to be honest. It's like it's still pretty, pretty bad. Um, but what did you calculate here? What did you find? um exactly exactly that um you know it's a, a thermal bridge and like we discussed with the flooring systems if you're using a thermal break it needs to overlap with your wall insulation to be somewhat effective but in wall situations that's hardly ever the case especially when you're you know when you're building with steel framing that usually is you know more of a commercial type approach for larger buildings and um, then you add, you know, minimal insulation into your walls, and it doesn't even fill out the 
doesn't even fill out the depth of the stat size. Um, so what's the thermal break going to do here? Just yeah, move usually, away. usually it's just like a strip of XPS that just, it's like a 10 mil strip that just gets stuck onto the, the steel. And the stud manufacturers are just like, yeah, it's perfect. It's good to go. It, it gets all your H1 check marks and stuff like that, but it, it, it really doesn't. Um, in reality, it might get you a check mark, it might get you a tick box, but um, with timber framing, I think we did some calculations and it was, you get a reduction of, you know, 20 to 30%, depending on how much timber you're using in your wall. Um, so like if you have a bag of insulation that says R2.5, let's say, for with timber framing, 20 to 30%, you'll get a reduction. And then with steel, it's like up to 50, sometimes even more, depending on how much steel you have in there. Um, so yeah, external insulation is is what I always recommend for steel studs, just continuous external insulation. Not only do you get a much better R value result, not only do you also get a lot less thermal bridging because you can see it's nice even temperatures here, but um, you can put a good membrane on the outside of this and your insulation outside of that. And it, it makes, installation easier it, it sounds harder because a lot of people haven't done it here in new zealand yet but it takes things off the critical path you you put your your steel studs up you put your sheathing on or your wrap board or whatever you want to call it put a membrane on and then you're weather tight you're watertight and then you can put your insulation on the exterior whenever your cladding arrives or kind of whenever you want um but also it's like a a jacket going over your whole building and not only are you oops not only are you um, closing up your thermal bridges from your studs here, but also when you get to your floor, you have a, you know, a slab edge, let's say, um, you have, you know, steel framing, perhaps, um, you know, structural steel, big thick steel. And if you have external insulation, it just covers all of that and it closes off all those thermal bridges. So it kind of solves a lot more problems than just specifically your, your wall framing here. Um, so. That's my recommendation. I think I think it's good. What do, what do you think, Denise? <laughs> totally agree with you. Just go for external yeah. insulation if you're using steel framing. Steel framing is yeah. not bad, um, not at all. Yeah, just works. just use external insulation and don't try and make yeah. it work the yeah. old-fashioned way. Yeah, if you're trying to make something that doesn't want to be energy efficient into something that is energy efficient by trying to use the exact same details as you would with timber, you're just going to have a bad time. Think outside the box. Use the proper use the proper assemblies for for the, the the materials that you're using. So yeah, fill your boots. Use steel steel structure, steel <laughs> steel studs. But external. Think space. outside the box. Insulate outside the box. <laughs> exactly. Outside that box. Uh, yeah, just wrap the whole thing. Uh, but anyways, wall systems, concrete panels or block. Okay, what are we what are we discussing here? What am I looking at? I'm I'm having trouble to understanding here. We yeah, so we we uh, we're switching a little bit between the, uh, the calculation methods here. Um, wow. So we've just um, uh, shown the difference between a mid floor section that is internally insulated um, and externally insulated. So okay. on the left, on the left, you see um, the overview with uh, an externally insulated uh, mid floor detail uh, oh. at the top right and then the top hold on a second hold on a second so we got purple here all the purple is concrete yes. all the green insulation so on the yes. left we have the concrete slab concrete beam over here concrete walls on the outside so it's all it seems like a, a precast building and that's the exact same thing over here the structure is all the same but for the left side we have fully continuous external insulation you can see how nice and wonderfully straight and continuous that is whereas here we're just insulating the inside of the walls. And a lot of times people would put strap and line, some timber with fluffy insulation in there. We definitely do not recommend that because of condensation risk. But just thinking about thermal stuff, you can see that there's a big thermal bridge right here from your slab through your um, beam there and then also out into your concrete. And it's just basically one big radiator, just bleeding heat to the exterior because all you can do is insulate here. I mean, you could start insulating the inside of this beam and then insulate the underside of the slab over here and then the top side of the slab no, over there. To... It doesn't even it's... work because you're just uh, yeah. <laughs> conducting the cold further inside the building. So sleeving yeah. it out is not 
is not going to make a difference. Um, yeah. You just you'd have to go like 500 mil or, or a meter into the building to actually make that, you know, a viable option. But then you're also dealing with condensation risk in case air starts getting through your insulation and you're just chasing your tail. So it's much better to just stop that heat flow at the exterior with a nice continuous piece. But anyway, sorry, I'll let you continue with uh, with what you were saying. Before. Exactly. <laughs> No, you, you had that all right. Um, and obviously, uh, we added some of the, the cladding images as well, that when you're when you're dealing with concrete uh, and exterior insulation, you do usually have some type of fixing. And even if that's metal, you do get um, thermal bridging through those fixings. So mm -hmm. I just showed an image that, you know, this is what it would look like if we had um, like a bracket fixing um, so this on the concrete. Exterior. This is exterior, this is interior, this yes. is the external insulation on the outside of the concrete, or this is the concrete, this between these two lines is the concrete. Oh, uh, the concrete is at the top with the, so, the white, the rainbow. Sorry, I oh. can't see your cursor. Ah, uh, um, okay, no one can see my cursor. Okay, interesting, I didn't know that. So yeah, so the rainbow, the yellow to green to yellow, that is the, the concrete between those two horizontal lines mm -hmm. and then insulation is outside of that with all of the thermoclines going through it and then you have your fixing there um, which is the L bracket that you can see right in the center sorry keep going yeah um, so you can see that there is you know a little bit of uh, thermal bridging going on through the metal bracket into mm -hmm. into the concrete here but it's mm -hmm. not quite as bad so we're, we're looking at somewhere around 14 or 15 degrees that's where that line is um, going to the interior surface so it's definitely yeah. a lot better than uh, what we see with the internal strap and line sort of approach where the temperatures go down to 11 point was it six seven um, just under 12 degrees looks um, like Bottom, yeah. bottom and right usually corner. and usually you know uh cladding fixings are sort of point fixings as well so, mm -hmm. so you only have that 14 degree temperature sorry yeah it, but that's just one point yeah you only have that 14 degree temperature in those in those single individual points and you know they get heated by the interior and 14 is actually not too bad doing pretty well and the insulation is all on the outside of here so even if there is condensation on this bracket it's outside of the building and it'll just drain and dry out denise you still there yeah oh, okay cool just uh because you, keep, you just, i keep cutting out a little bit yeah so that's why that's when i keep on uh, cutting in there for you just that we're we're not we're not losing that's everyone okay. here yeah but you can see at the bottom left corner here, um, you have the thermoclines on uh, on the bottom. So like for these four um, pictures on the left side of the screen, the top ones are showing the assembly. So the purple is concrete, the green is insulation, and then the bottom two show the thermoclines. And you can see that the bottom left one, because it's externally insulated, the concrete, all of it is nice and red. And you have a little bit of uh, a little bit of a thermocline at the the slab edge there. But generally, that concrete is nice and warm and it's at a good temperature for the interior. You're using the thermal mass properly as opposed to, as opposed to putting the thermal mass into the wrong location. Whereas the bottom right, um, you can see that the concrete is quite cold and even that slab edge and that beam are also still pretty cold in comparison. And it's only, you know, 500 to almost a meter into the building that the slab edge is actually the interior temperature as opposed to being affected by the cold. So putting external insulation just, it just fixes so many problems. <laughs> but any anything more to add here? Should I go to the next slide, Denise? I think you can go to the next slide. Awesome, cool. So roof systems, we got a cold roof, the bane of my existence, but we're gonna discuss it. I, I have feelings about cold roofs because I come from Canada and all we use is warm roofs there, but you tell me what, how, how do you do a good cold, <laughs> cold roof? With vapor control to start with. <laughs> There you go. There. And, and, and air did. tightness um but yeah same i think it's very similar to the floor system you use um timber beams you don't really need to worry too much about thermal bridging other than you know your general reduction factor for our values 
the ease of the factor in when you've got steel beams um you have to be a bit more cautious um with the internal insulation here in the middle you can see that you know there's a lot of cold conducting towards the interior face where there's an additional level of insulation sort of in line with the top right uh, top left picture um, of the roof assembly um, and then the very bottom is um, an external layer of insulation just showing how the steel is kept nice and warm one continuous piece of external insulation and then also a little bit between this the steel studs or steel beams joists whatever you want to call them um but yeah you can it, it'll it'll i guess work but the key thing like you mentioned is having an airtight um vapor control layer at your ceiling line to make sure that you're not having relatively moist air from the interior going into the attic space and then settling on the cold surfaces because you know even if you do put the thermal break on the outside of this steel even if you do put a, a continuous piece of insulation it's still i don't know they're uh, are they above 15 i guess but then at the yeah. under here. vapor control is uh well yeah um, a whole different a whole different ball game but sure. yeah you're right as long as you've got some vapor and air control on the inside you can possibly sandwich something like this together mm -hmm. um ideally try and uh, avoid steel framing just use you know timber beams at the ridge exactly yeah yeah just it, you're, you're taking risks and so here you can see that there's a five degree thermal line in there even with the thermal breaks and so you'll probably get some wetness in the insulation at some points of the year and then you're just hoping that it, it dries out properly through the underlay um and you know you got to have the heat and you got to have the airflow to make that happen but if you put a warm roof you get rid of that <laughs> risk <laughs> Can okay, we'll see it right here. We got a warm roof, and you can see. Look how toasty those those beams are. The the timber is nice and toasty. The steel is nice and toasty. Everything's toasty, and it's, it's just, just amazing, just oh, perfect. Yeah. Just a beautiful kind of like a layer, like a caramel slice kind of situation. Maybe maybe the colors could be a little bit different, but it's just good layers. Everything's nice and continuous. You're also making it so that your your structure moves less because steel, when you make it hotter or colder, it grows and it shrinks. And if you're doing that, you know, twice a day, every day, and then even more so in the winter when, you know, the sun comes out in the winter and it gets nice and hot on the outside, but still cold on the inside, you're, you're just flexing everything and you're stressing everything and you get much more durability if you keep everything at a nice constant temperature. But what else do we Funny see enough, here? that happens that happens to timber as well maybe at a slower rate but it does yeah it definitely does i think timber works it, it grows and shrinks a little bit more with moisture rather than temperature but still it definitely grows and shrinks it's, well, as we know it's all related yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah you can see here i mean this is self-explanatory do we have to do we have to explain this what do you think denise no just do a warm roof um, do but don't use uh, metal fasteners through yeah. um, through the warm roof. Exactly, especially if you're going into steel steel structure, those metal fasteners make things make things a little bit less good. There, <laughs> you can see that they're a little bit chilly. Keeps it a little bit chilly in here. It's still, you know, above fifteen degrees. But I don't know. Better to have it all nice and adhered instead. So I think the the temptation is to keep a metal roof on the outside as opposed to a membrane roof. I don't know why people have um, a general fear of membranes. I feel like there must have been some leaks that I wasn't here for um, back before I got here four years, <laughs> more than four years ago. Um, and everyone kind of just likes having the metal look on the outside. Um, but ideally, you don't penetrate your insulation with all those um, all those screws because you'll have these, these weird thermoclines, these weird... Um, uh, heat transfers at each point. Every time the screw goes in there, you'll have like a little pyramid of of heat loss through them. Um, so if you can avoid it, if you can make it less, then yeah, uh, you could look at fixing, you know, the battens through the insulation and then fixing the cladding into the battens so they exactly. don't necessarily touch. Yeah. So you have one screw that starts underneath the batten and goes into there, and then the other screw that 
holds the the roof into the bat instead. So yeah, that's generally what we design if we're forced to do this kind of design. Um, but yeah, steel and window and door systems, aluminium, aluminium steel, they kind of work the same. Aluminium is much more conductive than steel is, but they're both pretty conductive because metals are pretty conductive. That's what we use them for. Use them yeah, for water. So most windows are a thermal bridge in themselves. So yeah. dedicated section to them and as you can see the um the iso thermal lines are going all towards the blue as soon as the glass hits that frame so that's a mm -hmm. non-thermally broken aluminium suite um that's cool very, frame. yeah so it's, it's basically just uh exterior temperatures on the inside of that window frame yeah you can see yeah. how the lines sort of all go in towards the interior yeah exactly and i mean like that's this these are winter conditions but the same thing happens in the summer when it's really hot outside and you have the sun hitting that aluminium it makes the interior side really hot and that's less of a problem for condensation but it's still just uncomfortable to be next to you know a really hot window um during the summer yeah. so have you, have you ever lived in an overheating space that might uh, be a problem then <laughs> It might be the windows that are that are contributing a whole bunch. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, I wanted to correct myself. I keep on saying thermocline, but I'm, I feel like I'm thinking of um, scuba diving because when you scuba dive downwards, you hit a thermocline <laughs> and then you get that, that temperature change all of a sudden. But you're talking isotherms, which is the correct term. So <laughs> isotherms. Sorry, guys. <laughs> correct myself there. Um, but anyways, here's with a thermal break. Uh, you can see what a difference it makes. Um, we'll go back and forth a little bit. You can see this is all... On the right side, it's all blue at the frame, whereas when you put a little piece of plastic in it, it keeps the outside aluminium chilly, but the inside is nice and toasty. Well, maybe not toasty toasty, but at least over 12 degrees. It's better. Yeah, better. Exactly. So self-explanatory, right? We don't have to explain this, do we? No. Put a piece of plastic between your two pieces of metal and it works a little bit better. And then if you go for UPVC, it's even better than that. Um, we've switched locations here. Um, the right side is the exterior, the left side is interior. Whereas here was the opposite of that. Um, but you can see that the outside is all cold and then the inside is nice and warm. Um, yeah, use better windows, you get less thermal bridging. It's it's really that self-explanatory. Um, all of the calculations are on our previous um, presentations um, and you just get them from the window manufacturers. So don't have to worry too much about that. And then here's Timber. Once again, we're back to left is exterior, right is interior. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see that it's even even more consistent because with UPVC, um, generally these interior, you can see a square in there and a little U-shaped thing. Um, those are usually some sort of steel to give a little bit more structure to the UPVC depending on the, the size of the window. Whereas timber, it works pretty well because it's all just solid timber and uh we all know that it's generally a lot better than the metals at uh at preventing heat transfer so use better windows do better things windows and door systems glass edge spacers i feel like we discussed this kind of quickly in our window h1 um seminar session um but anything else you want to touch on here denise no, I just compared um, like a, a Swiss spacer makeup, uh, like a, a thermal spacer type with um, an aluminium spacer. And you can see how the isotherms are so spreading, spreading the, uh, you know, the temperature um, apart um, in the image on the left and the image yeah. on the right is a, is a thermal spacer. So yeah. that's sort of a, um, a component that has been um, adapted into the new H1 to some degree. Um, so there's some uh, arbitrary values, it, <laughs> it seems that have been used for different types of spaces. But this is basically the phenomenon that happens at the glass edge. And that's why it's important because it's uh, from all the components, uh, when we say the windows are the weakest link in, in a building, the glass edge is the weakest link of that component. So even with um, really high performance windows, you can still get condensation problems on the glass edge. That's mm -hmm. why you can get those beads um, around, you know, where the glass touches the frame. Um, even yeah. even in timber windows. Sure. If you don't have proper spaces in there. Yeah. So I mean, like rule of thumb is if it's a metal spacer, probably avoid it. If it's a 
you know, some sort of plasticky spacer, uh, thermal spacer, you'll have a, a much better time. Um, yeah, it's basically all there is to it. Think about the spacers. I feel like a lot of the, the manufacturers now have started just kind of offering thermal spacers as standard. And I think they were doing that because they're ramping up towards the H1 changes. Um, if you have a really large window with a lot of glass and not very much framing, um, I think you can almost still get away with um, non-thermally broken um, joinery. Once again, we don't recommend that. You're just you're just delaying the inevitable and making it so that you have a really hot or really cold um, frame, depending on the time of year. But um, to be able to make that comply with that 0 0.37, which is the interim step here in Auckland, um, you have to use good um, edge spacers and a good low E coating. Um, so I think they're starting to offer those kind of as standard, um, but don't waste your time with a, with a non-thermally broken window. Just use thermally broken windows. Cause like, like, like you just saw here, look how cold it is. Look how cold that edge is. Even if you have a good thermal spacer, even if you have a good, um, good glass, it's going to be cold at the, at the, the exterior there. Whereas you put a thermal break in, it makes it much warmer. UPVC even warmer than that, timber even warmer than that. And so, yeah really comes down to that so what's this all about systems low and thermal bridging yeah okay so just kind of comparing different uh different options here eh? yeah pretty much just a summary on on the presentation uh yeah. where you can be generally safe and you don't need to worry about thermal bridging too much anything you know timber your pvc whether that's framing or windows or any any other components mm -hmm. problematic always uh steel concrete um brick um unfortunately is uh, a bit tricky still and yeah it's not yeah so i mean if i can kind of follow in here so you have timber frame fault floors walls and ceilings um those are generally pretty good if you're using steel and concrete construction if you're using precast concrete on the exterior like we showed in those previous um those previous drawings there's a lot of thermal bridging that happens there and you have to do a lot more a lot more acrobatics to try to make it more more um more thermally efficient so we have a passive house that's currently being built um that is precast concrete but to make it thermally efficient it's 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 a sandwich panel that has concrete on the ins inside concrete on the outside and insulation in the middle the slab edges had to be dealt with in a certain way. Those those walls go continuously up over those slab edges to try to close off that that thermal bridge. Um, I'm not sure if if you have any other examples of what you had to do there to make that building efficient, Denise. Um, but there's just so many more acrobatics and other buildings that I've had with precast concrete on the outside and a steel frame. We've had to use spray foam insulation on the on the steel. We've had to tuck things underneath things it's just really hard to to install whereas timber kind of makes it easy but as a consideration if you put external insulation on that steel and concrete like we said previously it's like a jacket over the whole building you close up all those th thermal bridges it's fairly easy to install and it just kind of makes a lot of problems go away um with external insulation systems that's a really great way of doing things because that you know like we said solves a lot of problems, but brick construction makes it a little bit more difficult because you have to support those bricks. Usually you have a, sh a shelf angle, you might have at the ground floor some sort of step in your foundation to sit those bricks on top of. Those are places where you need to start closing thermal bridges. Um, and with bricks, um, there's a way to do it, but it's a little bit different. Um, you have to use brick ties that are two parts so that they're less um less conductive between there um the slab edges will usually have some sort of bracket that holds onto a shelf angle um so you have point thermal bridges as opposed to one continuous thermal bridge of that that shelf angle um these are you know prefabricated pieces but it's just extra work to make it to make it you know make it really efficient um Timber UPVC windows, those work really great. Aluminium or metal window frames, even, even the thermally broken window suites will be worse than the timber and UPVC. There are some aluminium or steel metal frames that um, are really well thermally broken, um, but they cost money. Um, and they'll just, you know, 
just meet up with the timber and UPDC, whereas you, timber and UPDC just do it naturally. It's just easy. And then um, thermal bridging, fully insulated slab on grade systems. That's really great. Um, if you have a waffle slab that doesn't have the insulation underneath, that's when you start having to do extra work to make it to make it efficient. Um, and then high thermal bridging is metal glass edge spacers. They're not going to be very good. Use a, a composite one or a plastic one. Thermal edge spacers. That's how it works. Oh, and then the considerations for windows. Yeah, thermally broken frames recessed into the center of the insulation line within the wall. If you have external insulation, then you can keep those windows in the same location kind of a little bit outside because the insulation is outside and your thermal break is lined up with that insulation that's on the outside. So the external insulation, I, I, it just it, it just works, guys. It just it just helps. Um, Sorry to, to kind of monopolize that for for a second there, Denise. But uh... no, it just solves so many problems for yeah. you know from from our point of view. So it's sure. definitely um, you know the way forward, especially when you're dealing with um, you know limited supply in in the market. You know, of, you know, getting good timber windows or your PVC windows. Um, yeah, you're stuck with the aluminium ones. There's definitely good ways to deal with it, and external insulation is one of them. Oh, yeah. yeah, even like if you have a non-thermally broken aluminium, it's a really complicated detail, but you could tuck them in and then put the insulation over the frame. But uh, that's you got to deal with <laughs> funky, funky flashings and stuff like that to make make it happen. But uh, anyways, that's I think that's about it. We got our, our Q and A. Um, does anyone have any questions? I, I don't know if anyone tossed any in to the chat while we were speaking but uh feel free to ask some now and then this is some more information if you're if you're on instagram we got our pink moose instagram um lots of information on there we have you know polls we just did our mold week um and had a competition for um showing photos of mold and things like that we're on linkedin we have our website it is soon to be updated we have a lot of information on there but it's a little bit hard to find but we are in the process of updating it now and then our next uh bs and bs will be confirmed i think we're gonna do one for um overheating overheating um you reckon we can fill an hour I think we can fill an hour, maybe an hour, maybe maybe more than like half an hour. But any questions, guys? Anyone anyone uh, looking for some information? We didn't really do too much complicated stuff, no math or anything like that. But lots of good pictures, lots of good explanations. Feel free to ask. You can type it in, or you can say it. Turn off your mic if you want to, if you want to be on the recording. But it might be less intimidating to just put it in the chat. Or if not, I guess we explained pretty well, and we'll let Denise go <laughs> back to sleep. On my on the... sunrise hike. <laughs> you going on the sunrise hike? Okay, cool, fair. <laughs> All right, well. Ooh, we got Glenda. How do you determine the performance of a window if the glass is replaced with an insulated panel, which New Zealanders love? Well, so you just follow I mean... the new uh, calculation for windows and you have to just replace the glass u value in that calculation with the u value of that replacement panel but yep. everything else would stay the same so you calculate the area of your frame section um, with the spacer value there that would have to be determined what uh, what that value is and then yeah. just the layers of the panel would have to be calculated to um so the n Four nine three. Don't quote sure. me on this. Um, wait, 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 yeah, and we'll believe you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So ba basically, like when you're doing a window in general, when you're calculating that, you calculate the U value of the frame. You calculate the U value of the glass, or in your um, in your example here, the panel, and then get your psi value between the two, psi value of the install, and then you're good. That's all the things. Anyone else? Any other questions? I think we answered all the questions. Apparently. Apparently, we just blasted through everything. Cool. I guess we might end uh, five minutes early. So, yeah, if you're, ooh, we got one more from an unknown, a secretive, mysterious person. Uh, do you <laughs> see a vapor barrier as? Essential even in a ventilated metal warm roof system. 
Uh, yes, absolutely, 100%, definitely, without any question at all, yes. Vapor barrier for a warm roof is 150 million percent necessary um, because it, it first of all, gets your building weather tight. You put you down your vapor barrier, and as long as you install it properly, it gets you weather tight, and then that takes your roof off of your critical path. You can start doing stuff on the inside. Um, but also, it's an air barrier and vapor control layer so that your interior warm air isn't tempted to go through. Because even if you have like a steel deck, um, the the laps of that steel deck, that could allow some airflow through. Um, there could be punctures from holes, from fixings, at the edges, let's say, at the perimeter, um, at intertenancy walls, things like that. So if you have one continuous vapor barrier across, you're preventing that airflow through to fill up your 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 roof section with with air with warm moist air to possibly cause condensation inside your warm roof assembly um and also and so, if i can sorry yeah. peter if i can add there usually mm -hmm. those uh, roof systems are applied in in sort of low roof pitches so anything sort of lower than 10 degrees so the ventilation in uh, those roofs is a bit limited by default yeah um and so you have to take additional yeah preventative measures to let moisture get into that roof to start with yeah because if you've got you know lots of ventilation through the roof then yeah you might get away with it but usually by default that's already limited with the yeah. construction system yeah so like i think we we talked about this on a previous um building science seminar um when you uh, have roof. a really low, really low pitch roof, um, you you need to have a really big cavity between your underlay and your metal roof to allow for that actual ventilation to happen. What what was it like? Like 150, 200 millimeters for a low pitch, something crazy like that, Denise? Uh, yeah. So the lower you go, the higher that section should be. That's the yeah. rule of thumb, and there's some European standards that um, sort of have quantified how how high that section should be depending on your roof pitch and the length of the actual uh, cavity system because there's um, yeah a lot of a lot of factors that go into the ventilation effectiveness yeah so Oops. if you have a ventilated or sorry uh when retrofitting okay so yeah just to finish off on that um when you have your warm roof um yeah definitely have a vapor barrier um, and then if you are relying on some ventilation between your underlay and a metal roof, it's less about ventilation and more about drainage of condensation. And so it's just the only things you're putting there are things that are okay being wet and then you're having it drain out any condensation that, that will occur. Um, Gary says, when retrofitting insulation into a sarked skillion roof, would you install a vapor barrier to the internal face of the sarking? Sarking no. goes... Where? What is sarking again? Because we have different terms oh, here versus Canada. Oh yeah, that would. Um, I think if you have sarking, that usually sits on top of the rafters. Um, you have your structure. So your, yeah, the sarking would sit on top. Um, but I think it's just a, a question about what you retrofit a vapor vapor control. So I wouldn't mm. use a vapor barrier as such because vapor barriers um, are a little bit too hard um for for this climate so they yeah. they usually work better in in colder climates but uh vapor control and more importantly ear control so if you can combine that with uh you know one of those fancy membranes from uh like sega or proclima um here in, in new zealand then use one of those and they even have uh, membranes that you can fit in and around the existing structure from the exterior so you can let that around and fit mm -hmm. in your insulation definitely yeah. a yes but no yeah. to vapor barrier <laughs> yeah so like what you would if if you're taking off the gypsum board from the interior and you have the sarking on the outside and you put your insulation in there then you put one continuous layer of a not vapor permeable, but a, an air control a layer vapor that control, has yeah. vapor control um, kind of allows things to dry either way. Um, but if you're taking the roof off of the outside, leaving the leaving the the gypsum board on the inside, then like Denise was saying, there's ones that you can install over the rafters that go down to your ceiling line, over the rafter, down to the ceiling line, and then that'll give you a little bit of air control there. 
Is that what you're saying, uh, Denise? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and D Demas is saying, yeah, vapor retarder, different various classes of vapor permeability. Yeah, the one that, that we would recommend for here in New Zealand, because it is pretty, not super cold, not super dry, um, You usually a smart vapor retarder that um, if it's super moist inside your roofing, it'll allow it to dry to the interior, but most of the time it'll, uh, it'll, it'll keep that that interior moisture from going in there. And yes, definitely no vapor barrier to the exterior of the sarking. Yeah, you wanna keep your vapor control layers. Um, the, the more vapor non-permeable, the, the less vapor permeable layers should go to the warm side of your insulation. And the more vapor permeable, allowing vapor to go out should be on the, on the cold side generally. That's the rule of thumb. Cool. Insulation to the cavities in steel framing, yes or no? Uh, oof. Uh, you, you can could... if you have enough insulation outside of that steel framing. Right. Rule of thumb is two thirds of the R value should be outside, and then you have your vapor control layer, and then one third on the inside, maybe if you wanted to. Um, yeah. Generally, you could put it on the inside, but you're not going to get much R value out of it. You'll just get like a little bit of extra top up, but most of it should be on the outside as exterior insulation. Um, Glenda, some people say it's not worth installing a warm roof to an existing leaky home when the VCL between the roof and wall, the vapor control layer between the roof and wall is not continuous. What's our thoughts? My thought is that it's always worth installing a warm roof, always, period, full stop, end of story, always worth it. <laughs> And so even if it's not continuous, the vapor control layer between the roof and wall, if it's not continuous, make it continuous. Figure out a way. There's always a or way. Or just allow for it to be retrofitted at a later stage. Because exactly. we all know we can't we can't build ROM in a day. So just make it uh make it uh, so you can connect to it at a later stage. Yeah, leave an extra lap there, make a plan for the future to make it continuous. But the even if you're not connecting the vapor control layer at those per, at those terminations at the um the transitions to the walls you're still getting the 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 warmth of the warm roof you're still getting the r value improvement you're still getting the vapor control or sorry the condensation control improvement elsewhere other than those places and so you can always make it better later on and then Dima says 50% reduction in effective R value for insulation within the steel stud cavities without external insulation. Completely agree. Yeah. And you have a high risk of interstitial condensation with steel studs. We mentioned that earlier on, and we're going to repeat it again. If you use steel studs, if you use steel framing, use external insulation. XPS thermal break on steel framing, vapor permeable or barrier. Um, the steel is already a, a a vapor barrier and so putting xps on the outside of that steel doesn't make any difference really but the it also doesn't really make a big difference to the thermal performance of those steels as we saw the uh, in the isotherms i was going to say thermal clines again but in the, um, <laughs> yeah you, you make your steel a little bit warmer but you're still losing a lot of r value and you still have that condensation risk so if you're using steel framing put fully external insulation for your walls fully external insulation for your roof just just put ex external insulation it'll help a little bit that thermal break but it it doesn't do much i don't think it's worth it <laughs> it's it's a lot of extra work for not a lot of gain so yeah i think that's about it we're good, three minutes good over discussion this. towards the end of our um yeah. presentation now traps moisture the xps won't trap moisture no um, the, the steel, the steel is already a vapor barrier and you're just putting it there and they're intermittent. Um, if you're putting one continuous layer of XPS on the outside of your steel studs, that's when you could get into trouble that, that will trap moisture in. If it's really thick and then everything on the inside of that is nice and warm, then you might be okay. But anytime you put rigid insulation, vapor impermeable, vapor closed insulation on the outside, on the cold side, that's when you can get into trouble. So you got to be careful with that. You got to do some woofy modeling and do some checks to make sure you're not going to get in trouble later. Anyone else? Any other questions before we go? Denise, if you want to go and get on your, your hike there, I'm not sure what time you got to meet people. But, <laughs> my, uh, my sunrise hike. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'll stay on for another few minutes just in case anyone has questions. But thanks, Denise. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Talk to you later. Have a good afternoon. Yeah.
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good morning. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. Good info as usual. Happy to hear it. Let us know if you need any help. Uh, we got resources online. Hop on our Instagram account if you have it. We try to cross post things. So once we do this, uh, this, uh, these webinars, we try to post some of that stuff onto Instagram, onto LinkedIn, onto Facebook as well. So yeah, thanks guys. Have a wonderful rest of the day. See you again for the next one. Maybe